Welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. My name is Douglas O'Keefe. I produce these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy, and I'm the host of the chats. And today I'm in London, England. You wouldn't believe it looking at the beautiful weather today, but it's Sunday, October 21st, and we have an amazing day here in England. So today I'm interviewing Matt Spike, who has generously donated the use of his studios here in Soho. And we will begin the interview now. And Matt Spike, welcome hey. to Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. I would like to personally thank you for the use of your amazing studio facilities here in Soho. My pleasure. And for arranging such a beautiful day for us I here know. in London. Yeah, I had a word with the Archangel Michael. Yeah, that was uh, very kind of yeah, you. I came appreciate it. through for it. us. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your early years. How did you come out to your family? Um, well, my early years, um, I was born on the east coast of England, um, yeah, which is very rural, or despite being quite close to London. Um, and um, so I w it was a very um, village existence, um, you know, village fates, Methodist church, quite normal, quite, quite, quite average. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, some would even say it was just boring. It was just very, very nice um, for the first, at least first four or five years of my life and then until my parents divorced and then we kind of all then got shunted around places um, and lost contact with my father for a number of years. Um, and. Uh, Coming out to my mother was fucking horrific, quite frankly, um, because uh, she had this kind of idea of homosexuality as being a, a sort of a lifestyle choice, if you like, uh, which I don't think it is. I think you're born gay. Um, I think yes. there's a few people that probably become gay for other reasons, political, maybe they've been maltreated or something. But for me, I, it's, I, I, I sort of think it comes naturally. So, um, and I just remember, you know, I went through that stage where you, you tell your parents that you're bisexual first, um, just to ease them into it. Um, and I did that with her, and I said that I might be bisexual. And, and she was like, well, do you, will you still get married, though? And I said, yeah, I expect so. No, <laughs> hell no. Um, at that stage, because marriage was only to with a woman at that stage. And um, so I, um, you know, used to hang out with her, and couples would walk past, you know, like an elderly couple and she'd kind of cry and say, you know, what's so wrong with that? You know, and I'd say, well, nothing, but it's just not what I want in my life. And this went on for a number of years. We sort of played cat and mouse with each other, really. She, she just uh, kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until one day uh, we were driving down a really fast road and she just basically came out with, she said, you're gay, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she swerved across three lanes of busy traffic and then pulled the car up in a, um, what we call a lay-by, like a kind of a little rest area. And she um, cried for about two hours. Um, but then she kind of said, look, you know, it's fine. You're my son. So if you're gay, you're gay. Um, she said, my problem is, is that um, why don't I get to tell your stepfather that she'd remarried by that point. Um, she remarried a guy who was uh, quite a kind of, um, which, like a man's man. He was very much into football and cricket and golf and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and he'd passed the odd kind of joke. Um, if you saw somebody a little bit effeminate on TV, he, he would pass the occasional joke, you know, about oh, I mean, a guy like that or something like that. And she interpreted this as his homophobia. So when, when I came out to her, she, she said, look, you know, I'll always support you, but what's my problem now is, is what if your stepfather doesn't like this? She said, I can't stay married to a guy who won't accept my son. I won't do it. And um, it was actually a friend of mine who I don't see anymore, but um, he was a big friend of mine at the time. And he, um, he I, I kind of told him about this. And one evening she phoned me up in one of her panics. And um, uh, she said, tonight I've got to tell him. I've got to tell him tonight. And uh, my friend encouraged her to do it. And she sat there, apparently it was winter. So she sat there alone in the darkness after work until he came home. He, switched, he said, what, why are all the lights off in the house? And she said, I've got something to tell you. And he, he went, okay, and kind of sat down. And she, he said, what is it? And she said, um, well, he's gay. And my stepdad said, yeah, I know, but what's the bad news? So anyway, um, I got a phone call. I was in London, she was back at home. And I got a phone call about 20 minutes later from my stepdad. And he kind of said, uh, hey, it's me. Your mum's told, you, told me you're gay. Um, I don't give a fuck. Uh, so when are you coming home next? And it was just like a huge, Massive relief was taken off my shoulders. It was, it was, so it, it came out really, it, it was a prolonged coming out 
over several years with a lot of drama that ended really, really well. Uh, at what age, what age for you was all of this going on? Oh my god, well it started um, at the age of about 16 and then went on till I was probably about 23. Oh my gosh. So it was a long time. Yeah. And actually, one of the, her big regrets, regrets now is that she missed out on about six years of my life because I wasn't comfortable talking about anything gay with her. Um, you know, I, uh, she is the one that thinks this actually, is that she, she's now making up for lost time. Um, she, I took her to Compton's this year, twice. Um, where she had a beaker of wine <laughs> and, uh, and stood outside in the summertime with all my friends coming by and complimenting her on her draped jersey and she had a great time. Um, it's just such a change and it's such a turnaround from, from how she was. Um, so she's making up for lost time now, which is really, really nice. And now I'm engaged, you know, she's, uh, she's really excited about that as well. So it's, it's, it started off horrible and ended out really well. But when you were young and you were in your school years, yeah. you experienced a very rough time. You were mm. even assaulted mm. as a child. Yeah. Tell so, us a bit about that. Yeah, I was bullied at school for being gay and sometimes viciously bullied. And it did get physical at times as well. Um, it didn't really happen until, I mean, I went to a middle school, which was quite, quite a small school. I think the, it only had about 500 pupils in it. Um, and then at the age of 12, what they do here is they kind of siphon all the small, at least they did then, they siphoned all the smaller primary or middle schools into big high schools. And so suddenly I was transferred from the comfort of a small rural school um, into, uh, in the countryside, into a gigantic, uh, brutalist nightmare of a building um, in a town. And, uh, and about eight or nine schools were feeding into this and they came from a variety of different areas. And so some of the schools that were feeding into the high school were, were from quite what we call rough areas. Um, and so into my life came people who would, you know, take a craft knife and slice your arm um, for being gay, um, try and cut your cock off um, so that you couldn't wank again, things like that. Um, that never happened, <laughs> thank God, but it was threatened. Um, and certainly I had a knife held to my throat. I've actually still got the scar um, on my wrist um, for when I was held down in, and slashed with a craft knife um, in, in high school. And I didn't report any of this either um, because the repercussions would have been terrible. How so? Well, uh, none of the school would have understood. Um, at that time, um, I remember my English teacher, um, English literature teacher, Taught, told the group about the word gay and he said, um, I, remember, I can remember this as clear as day, it would have been about 1990, 89, 90, and he said, uh, the word gay used to mean happy, colorful, uh, proud, um, he said, but it's been overtaken by a group of perverts to, to now mean homosexual. Um, and so if the teachers are kind of saying that kind of thing, um, you don't really feel comfortable, you know, telling them about this kind of thing. You don't even want to tell them you're gay. There was no school counselling. It's quite funny, actually, because my second cousin has been through the same school, and she's a lesbian, and uh, she had counselling. <laughs> so since, between me being there and her being there, they've actually overcome all these issues and now have a school counsellor who encouraged her to come out at school uh, before she had taken her, her diploma as a school. Um, but yeah, I, it, was, it was horrible, and uh, I often used to skip school and come to London, in fact, Soho. Um, so I'd sort of uh, leave, leave the house, turn left instead of right, and go to the train station and just come into London all day, take off my school uniform, the train, change, and then put it back on and go back in the evening just to, you know, she worked, so she was never home before 6.30, so she'd never know if, if I'd been at school or not. My brother would forge a note or just tell the, head, uh, the headmaster that I wasn't coming in today. Um, I was sick, and... Uh, no, I didn't really get caught for about two or three years, but I just used to come to Soho and walk around and just think, this is so amazing. And so I knew then my life was not going to be in, in rural England. Um, it, could, it could never be. Um, and uh, yeah, and I skipped school to avoid the bullying for it. So yeah, it was horrible. It was really horrible. How did you have any concept about coming to Soho? Mm. How did you even know about that? Well, I'd seen it on TV um, and I'd read about it and uh, I had an obsession with London anyway, from an early age. Um, my parents took me here when I was probably about four or five for a day trip and um, day out, you know. And um, since I stepped foot in London, 
I just loved it. I loved the energy and the pace and everything about it. The only other city in the world that's ever been able to do that to me. There's two other cities in the world that have done that to me since, and that's New York and Johannesburg. But I loved, I loved the fast pace of London. I liked the impersonality of it. I liked the idea that everyone at home in the village knew who I was, knew my business, and that I could come here and just, just not be part of a small crowd of people who know everything about each other. Um, that was what impressed me most about London was. It seemed so impersonal and individual. I loved that. I really loved that. And actually, now I'm getting older. <laughs> my trip's home now. I come away and I think, oh, no. <laughs> that was so nice with my family. Now I've got to go back to London. Um, so it's kind of 180 a bit. But you know, at the time, coming to Soho it was just absolutely amazing. Wonderful. I'd never, be, I'd never seen fashion like it. I'd never seen. I saw dominatrix pulling you know, their slaves across the, the street and stuff like that. And I thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. It's not like that anymore now. It's changed a lot. You know, it's become quite. Um, uh, well, gentrified, but yeah. um, but in this is, so when I was skipping school, this would have been 88, 89. It would have been the peak of all that kind of Kylie Minogue, Starcake, and Waterman type music, um, and it was really cool. It was it was it was it was it was really cool in the 80s. hadn't been re London hadn't been re reconstructed yet, and it was it was. I mean, for example, where the train terminated when I when I skipped school. There wasn't Starbucks or Costa or anything like that. There was one cafe which had a spoon hanging from a string, and everyone used to use the same spoon to stir the sugar into their coffee. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> my gosh. Then they redeveloped the station, and it all became like the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, how were you initially exposed to the concept of fetishism? What magazines did you see? What things did you learn? Um, it wasn't so much magazines, because um, Fetish magazines, uh, just I didn't see any. Um, there just weren't any around. Um, it came from within. I, I, I don't know how, but I just realized I liked leather, the material. Um, I thought it looked really sexy and hot. Um, so the first thing I used to do was, um, my mother used to order these great big huge um, catalogs, like clothing catalogs, mm. it's pre-internet. Yes. And she would order our clothes from catalogs. and. Um, I would basically go through the catalogues and skip through to the motorcycle section to where they sold full-on leather motorcycle gear. And I'd cut them out and then peel the corner of the carpet back in my bedroom and then just store them under there, under my bed, in the oh. corner of the room. Um, when I came back from my first break from university, the corner had been excavated <laughs> and nothing was said. But um, yeah, um, I used to collect those um, and uh, films like, um, well, Greece, I suppose, was the first time I saw guys like looking really hot in leather, and that was on the TV. Um, and then later on, I started seeing films like Cruising, um, which had leather guys in it. I, I remember seeing lots of black and white ones, maybe the wild ones, films like that. Um, I started to watch and get slightly upset, more, more very obsessed with. Um, and then George Michael came along, uh, which was great. That happened about 1987 or 88, I think, when he released his Faith album. Yes. He's kind of pulling on that leather jacket, and he's got the stubble, and, the, and, the, and then I saw that album cover in the local record store, and then um, I was walking home, and I was thinking, I want to have sex with a man like that one day, and I, was, I, I couldn't even believe I was thinking it, you know, but I, I then started to sort of imagine things in my head at night when I then started to masturbate, and um, I used to invent characters inside my head. I'd even draw them, or draw what they look like, and uh, things like that. Um, and there was a guy, ironically, one of the guys that used to bully me at school who wore a leather jacket to school. It wasn't a black leather jacket, but it was a brown leather jacket. It was very fashionable at that time, about 89, 90. Um, and uh, even though he bullied the shit out of me, I used to follow him everywhere. I was obsessed with him. Um, I can't remember his name, but um, he was tall, very handsome, and wore this brown, shiny leather jacket. And he used to walk with it, you know, very much like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a bad boy. No, I can picture him in my mind clearly. I can't remember what his name was, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the movie Cruising. Yeah. Um, that's been a definitive movie for a lot of people mm. in our community. Yeah. What about it appealed to you? Um, I think uh, it was the first time I'd ever seen the material leather connected to um, something else. So. Um, my leather fetish up until I saw films like that um, had just been purely about the thrill of wearing leather, full leather. And, you know, it does create quite a storm. Even now when you wear it, people sort of look. Yes. Um, 
And I do think men look attractive in, in leather, and I think everyone agrees with that, whether they're gay, straight, into fetish or not. So cruise, films like Cruising then show me that there was something connected to leather culture, sex, and rough sex. And I was frightened at first, you know, not excessively scared, but I was a bit like, <gasps> but then after a while I realized that actually it was quite, 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 yeah, I, I can see how this is all panning out now. I can see where this is going. It's dark and it's, it's black and it's sort of got something a bit of the night about it. And um, uh, yeah, that's when it began. That's what films like Cruising did. How did you begin exploring the leather fetish scene? Well, yeah, this is the thing I think that divides me between it divides me from, say, the new, what they call the newbie crowd, is that um, there was no internet, or there was, it was just beginning. It was very, you know, it was, it, it, there were no hookup apps or anything like that, there were no apps. Um, so I had to go and do it by myself. Um, luckily, th there was actually the internet, and through Gaydar, I met some people. I, ha I got a master, first of all, he was fantastic. Um, it's called Uncle Kellen, um, if he's watching. Um, thank you. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was a punk. He had um, big, spiky punk hair, and he wore a jacket just like this, and he was tattooed all over, and he smoked big cigars, and he was um, very, very good at... Um, he just introduced me to the f little little bits in his, in his flat in Pimlico, little bits. I remember once he tied up my cock completely with shoe, shoe, shoelace, and then held it, and then started sort of touching it with a violet wand and things like that, and uh, whilst I was tied on his bed, and... Uh, whenever we hung out, I, we kind of became boyfriends for a while and I would always have to sit on the floor whilst he sat on the bed looking down at me. And I started to really like these little mind games because for me it's all in the head. The sex is all in the head. You know, it starts in the brain. And so I suppose role playing was, was really great. You know, he, he taught me that. I, I found it really sexy. You know, just go and lie on the floor, on your back, and he'd lay on the bed. And so you'd create this kind of power exchange. And that's, that, was, that was great. But um, I also, at the same time, as well as soliciting kind of uh, on the internet, I had to go out to thrift stores and buy second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand leather. Um, I look at pictures of myself now when I was about 25 or 26, and the stuff I bought was horrible, really bad, bad condition. But it didn't matter because um, I was a leather man. And, um, yeah, I, I just used, I was, the first one I ever went to on my own was the Back Street where we were last night. And um, uh, I lived in Bethnal Green, I was probably about 26, and um, I just walked there on my own and just went into the club on my own and sat there and, yeah, and talked to people. Um, yeah, I just, just, just went out and did it, really. I think that's all you could do back then. There was, wasn't a support network for you then. Um, you had to just go out and, and find the leather bar and, and get involved. That's what I did. Yeah. Tell me more about what was going on in your head with your exploration with, I'm sorry, the gentleman's name. Ah, oh, Uncle Kellen. Yeah, Uncle yeah. Kellen. Yes. What was going on in my head? Uh, I was living my dream. I was absolutely living my wildest fantasies. Um, up until that point, I was hanging around with a group of people in East London um, who were not fetish and who would laugh at the leather man image, um, and uh, they, I would dis you know we were we were sort of like a little clique of about seven or eight people, and um, I would disappear for two or three days and come back dressed in leather and stuff, and they would just be like, oh. you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so my bonds with them began to break, and I began to meet more and more fetish people. So what was going on in my head was that um, I was finding out that actually I wasn't just some kind of regular. Um, kind of little uh, faggot on the scene, <laughs> you know. Um, but I was, in fact, um, uh, something more. You know, my, my identity as a gay man was not with going clubbing and um, in, in a crop top and a pair of shorts. Um, it was actually to get fully dressed up in leather and go out and actually look for someone that would, you know, tie me up and spank me and stuff like that. Yeah. Tell me how that evolved for you. The people you met, the experiences you had. Was there anything shocking, anything fascinating? Oh, um, yeah, oddly enough, none of it shocked me at all and, and still doesn't to this day. Um, but I guess there were lots of surprising things. I remember the first ever visit to the Hoist um, with Uncle Kellen with me on the leash. It was really interesting because uh, we walked in and they weren't playing any music. Oh. Uh, or they were, it was very quiet. 
So, uh, you know, um, and the, but there was some, someone shouting in the corner. Someone was really shouting, and, and he. And I said, what's going on? And he kind of said, this is a verbal scene that's going on here. And so someone had someone on the St. Andrew's Cross and was literally just screaming in his face. And I was just stood there for ages watching it and just thinking, wow, that's amazing. And then um, I was on a leash being dragged around. And then some other guy came up and asked Uncle Callum, my master, said, um, can I thrash your slave? And uh, so Uncle said, he wants to thrash you. And, I said, OK, is that OK with you? He said, it's OK with me if it's OK with you. So he took me off, and I got my first spanking on the St. Andrew's Cross in the hoist. Amazing. Um, yeah. Um, loads of things going on like that. I mean, you know, for someone that's not really experienced it before, um, that was fantastic. I think that back then, things were more protocol um, and more quiet. Yeah, so I was on the St. Andrew's Cross getting spanked. You know, when you you know that age, just coming out to, to a gay bar, to a leather bar for the first time, you know, it was it was nothing. I it wasn't I wasn't ever afraid of it, but I was fascinated by it, absolutely fascinated by it. Um, yeah. Tell me more about the back street and the hoist. Mm. Both of these places, I've only visited the back street once. Okay. How was it when you discovered it? Uh, the back street. Well, both um, bars when I first discovered them um, were much quieter. Um, I guess. Well, the back street often does is quiet sometimes then but the I mean quieter as in the sense of people were much more there wasn't that so much of the social side of it I don't think I think people went to these places deliberately to kind of um, do what they needed to do and then go home um, I don't think there was any of this kind of social side I, I, I don't think oh. there was I think that obviously there were people that were into leather and BDSM who would form friendships obviously you know um, but you didn't go to the hoist expecting to spend half your night in conversation about, you know, um, I don't know, the Kardashians or something, um, which kind of happens these days a little bit. Um, but again, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. But um, I just, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's just distance, you know, from that era. Maybe just, I'm just looking back at it through rose tinted glasses. But I definitely detect a bit of a sense of there being less of a social side and more of a purpose. People would go to these places for the purpose of, of doing it. They were like play spaces or creative spaces where people oh, could okay. sort of live out their personas. Um, these days I feel like um, people's personas are probably in place first and then, um, then they get into the harder side of sex. Um, yeah. yeah. During that time, what did you discover about yourself in relationship to your BDSM journey? Well, actually, the thing I, I had discovered about myself was um, that I am not a bottom. Uh, I had quite a, um, I was quite a gentle person growing up. Um, but then I sort of realized after a year or so of sort of being people's slaves and bottoms that actually I thought that I'd quite like to be the top. Um, so, yeah. That is what I learned most of all. And still to this day, I really, really, really don't like being dominated by anyone. I let my fiance dominate me. <laughs> That's OK. But uh, no, I hate it. I absolutely hate my control being taken away. Um, I hate getting fucked. Um, but I just love topping people. I absolutely love it. Whether it's just, you know, well, I mean, I'm engaged now, so the, the, the days of playing around are kind of behind me. But I would, I would, I would just absolutely love to top people. and. Um, I eventually turned that into a bit of a career progression, in fact, later on, uh, slipping into escorting um, around about uh, 19, well, I left university in 1999 and got into a series of dead-end jobs that were going nowhere, corporate shit jobs, you know, and um, basically, uh, at the end of the day, I had enough, I was getting depressed doing the whole nine-to-five commuting thing, and I thought, well, I'd been in escort twice before to support myself during university, just as a regular escort, you know, just wearing pants and that kind of thing. Um, massages with happy endings, blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, well, what about if I just sold this? And it worked. And actually, nowadays, you can look in the magazines and on the uh, escorting websites and see lots of uh, dom guys who are in their 20s and stuff. But at the time, there was nobody else doing it that young. And I got a bit of a niche because a lot of my clients were in their 50s and 60s and actually quite enjoy being tied up and dominated by this uh, demented 20-something <laughs> guy. Um, why, why demented? 
How demented? <laughs> I was taking a lot of cocaine at the time. Um, I'd left a proper job and was existing on the uh, earnings of prostitution. Um, and drugs came a part of my life. Um, so I, yeah, I wasn't, I was probably not my best self at that time. Although looking back, I was having the time of my life. Um, uh, yeah, in general, you know, when you're in your twenties, you sort of uh, have a very much more carefree attitude now. I mean, like, you know, these days, if I wake up in the morning and find that there's not enough milk to make a coffee in, in the fridge, I kind of, uh, you know, get freaked out by that. Whereas in my 20s, I'd have just probably just drunk the coffee black and thought, fuck it, you know. Um, so, you know, um, I guess I was just a bit more rebellious and adventurous back then. Well, what do you think of the art of cruising? Oh, I think it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I wish it still, I wish it still kind of uh, happened because uh, I feel like it's moved online now and I think it's all kind of uh, in apps and I don't think there's any art to it anymore. I would say the art of cruising perhaps has been lost by most people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because we've all had those grinder conversations and um, they're, just, they're just a string of words that are put together and aren't particularly very um, eloquent. Um, there's nothing sexy about it. It's all very much, you know, upfront about everything. There's no kind of... I, used to, I remember used to going to the hoist and sort of catching people's eye and sort of staring at them and, you know, and I was pretty good at it. Um, I think it might have been lost now a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course now I'm engaged, I don't really tend to sort of, you know, cruise. Uh, I don't need to, but um, I can see it. When I go to events and clubs these days, I can see that people are sort of cruising in the sense they're looking and checking out the goods, but they're not really having that flirtatious, homosexual kind of uh, cat and mouse game anymore, which I always thought was wonderful and uh, loved it, absolutely loved it. Looping back slightly, back, let, let's take a few steps back. Tell me more about how you got into the scene being an escort. Uh, how I got into escorting? Yes. Right, okay. Um, well, like I said, I, mean, I, I left university with a French and politics degree. Um, which does fuck all for you, really, unless you want to be a teacher. Yeah, I should think. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't really do much for you. Um, at the, when they sell you the degree, it's like, oh, you, you know, you're going to end up running the European Union or something. But no, um, I got out of university and found that there were no jobs for me. Um, so I ended up working at, first at a publishing company, which I hated. Um, although um, that did give, my, give me my first permanent kind of access to having a computer, because I didn't have a computer at home. Um, but I had one at work on my desk and luckily my screen faced away from my boss. So yeah, sure, sure I was typing up those, those Excel spreadsheets whilst also looking at guys in leather and uh, watching porn films on it. And this went on until there, a circular email went around the company saying, somebody, we're not going to name who, is looking at porn all day. Will they, <laughs> will they, will they stop or they, they will be named? <laughs> That's when I stopped. Um, uh, yeah, I used to, I, I, for a good year, I used to spend practically nine to five trying to get my jobs done so that I could have at least 15 minutes during my lunch hour to you know, look at some porn online or just pictures. Um, and uh, um, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Um, so I then dumped that publishing job for a job in TV. I worked for a TV company called Carlton TV, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and uh, my boss was a, a nightmare. She was horrible. She was absolutely horrible. Nasty woman to work for. Um, the company itself was, was, was dull. Um, we were just selling TV programs. We weren't involved in any of the production or the glitz of it all. We were just selling shows to other channels around the world. And um, so if you ever go to South Africa and see Inspector Morse, then that was me. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I, I kind of just grew fed up with it and then I just decided to rebel. So I created a, an escort page on Gaydar, put some pictures up, found some photographers from somewhere, God knows where, put some pictures up, created an escort profile, published it online, and then uh, sent the, emailed the link to it to my boss. <laughs> Who then about three seconds later opened the email and said, can you come in here please? and shut the door, and I went into her cubicle and shut the door, and she said, you're not seriously going to do this? And I said, yeah, I am. And she, she, she said, when? I said, now, I've started, I'm advertising, I think, I think I've just got a message. <laughs> I might have a job tonight. And she's like, so you're leaving now? And I said, yeah, I'm going, bye. Wow. Yeah. And I just cleared my desk and walked out. 
Wow. Yeah. And I went home and I was living in the east of London at that time and you could see all the tall buildings in the financial district, the city of London. And uh, I was on the fourth floor of a terrace building and I could just see the tops of them and I remember thinking that, you know, that's the, the, that's, that's the money making part of the world. And now I, I can then, I can actually go out, I, I got it into my head that I could actually go, I could kind of do things my way. I thought, you know, this is, we live in an open market. I don't have to go to this corporate mincing machine in order to make money. I can make money however I want. And so for the next few years, I'm going to make money out of, you know, selling um, leather sex. And I did. Tell us more about that. What experiences did you have? What did you learn doing this? <laughs> I learned that um, quite a lot of clients are actually just in need of someone to talk to. Um, I also learned that some clients are fucking crazy and need to be locked up. Um, and uh, I learned that there are a lot of very unhappy um, straight men out there who um, fantasize about um, fetishism and so forth. Um, what else did I learn? Uh, God, I learned to become very strong. You have to, that job makes you very, very strong. You know, when I was doing out calls, especially in the early days, I would often find myself on a, like a, <laughs> some suburban train platform with a huge suitcase full of bondage gear and masks and gloves and things like that. Um, I often used to find myself on train stations with this black suitcase I had full of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, when it's like midnight, and it's raining and it's January and you've just tied up a guy in a barn in Berkshire and he's driven you to the station and thrown 250 pounds at you and stuff and then you're sat there on your own waiting for the last train back to London and stuff. You know, you, it is lonely. It's kind of lonely um, and it makes you tough. Um, when you've got a client who's crazy, um, literally crazy, um, and you have to stay strong for them. But also when, um, I think it taught me responsibility as well because I then started to get into more serious things like breath control and bondage and things like that. And uh, then I realized I had somebody's life in my hands as well. So I, I learned many things. I learned to be strong. I learned to be much more self-reliant than I would have, become, would have, been, would have done if I'd stayed in the corporate sector. Um, and uh, I also learned that, um, yeah, the responsibility side, you know, actually ensuring someone's safety during a really heavy scene. Yeah. What was there anything shocking you you had to do anything that was uh, completely out of your realm anything that was yeah there was uh, unusual yeah yeah um there was a gas um one client liked it, uh, a certain type of gas i can't remember what it was called now um so it was i can't remember what it was some sort of gas apparently it knocks you out straight away um, and we did a couple of sessions, and yeah, um, I knocked him out completely. And chloroform or some such thing? It was, yeah, it wasn't chloroform, but it was, it was a gas you can buy a canister. Oh. And um, you'd, they would inhale it. I, they'd put a rubber mask on with tubes coming out, and I would just get them to inhale it until they were unconscious, and then they wanted to get fucked whilst they were unconscious. So, yeah, that did make me a little bit scared, especially buying the actual stuff as well. You know, I had to go, had to go and buy it, and then go to some suburb of London and do it to somebody. Um, I've just remembered, it's just coming to my head, um, I remember when I was escorting um, that I got a job in a place called Nunhead, which is in South London, it's a nothing suburb in South London, and um, uh, I went there, I did the job, the guy paid me, but I noticed that the interior decor was <laughs> really 70s or even 60s, and that um, it looked like someone had literally just moved out, and as I was leaving, and he, he drove me back to the train station, I said to him, like, I'm not being funny, but are you decorating or something? Because that flat is just weirdly, like, you know, the big 70s flowers on the walls. And he said to me, no, it's actually my mum's flat. She died last week, and um, I didn't want to go to my place because my boyfriend's there. So I was like, so, so I just tied you down to your <laughs> recently departed mother's bed. I kind of thought, if my mother died last week, I'm not sure if I would do that. <laughs> That struck me as a bit odd. That's more comedy, I guess, but <laughs> it was still a bit weird, you know. How long did you work as an escort? I think roughly for about 10 years. Oh my um, gosh. As a, as a, as a full-time escort, so that being my only source of income. During that time, I did a couple of um, stints in the gay shops. Um, now, Clone Zone, I worked at Clone Zone for a while, where I got fired for stealing porn and poppers. <laughs> 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 um, 
And I was then, for a short while, I was a supervisor at a furniture store, um, which was uh, dreadful. <laughs> but um, yeah, I pretty much supported myself using my earnings as an escort. But I wasn't completely stupid. I did save some of the money. I didn't blow it all on clothes and drugs. I um, saved some of it, and I bought my started by myself camera equipment, cameras, um, uh, card readers, bits you need for photography. Um, some of some of the stuff I bought with my escort earnings all those years ago, I still use even now. Um, some of the triggers and flashes and flash guns and stuff are from that time. Um, uh, yeah. How did you begin uh, moving away from that into a new it just, realm? It started just to become, I just started to become a bit resentful of, of the clients. Um, and I, if any of them are watching, I'm really sorry to have to say this. I didn't resent anyone personally. What I resented was them coming into my home. And um, I just started to feel that it was a little bit... I was a bit tired of it, really, you know. Um, I used, some of them were, as I say, some of them were, co were quite unhinged mentally. Um, you know, one of them told me um, that uh, he had connections and I, he could have me, um, make me disappear. Um, he would say that during sex. And as he ejaculated, he would say, he would say, give me AIDS, give me AIDS, I want a life of dependency on pills. That was what he said while he was ejaculating. And when these people are in your home, you kind of think, well, this is my home. And I, I believe in energies anyway. Uh, I'm a bit woo-woo like that. And I kind of, <laughs> and I, I, I honestly believe that they would leave an aura of themselves in my home. So, in, and I didn't want them to see any pictures that I had hung up in, in case they could see my family or some, and then somehow psychically leave something behind. So I used to take everything off the walls, all the objects off the, all the shelves, you know, and hide them. So there were bare walls, nothing so that the, the client coming into my apartment could not see anything about my taste in furnishings or interiors, mm. Mm. couldn't see any photos of any friends, he knew nothing about me. And then of course when they left an hour later I had to put everything back up again, you know. It was ridiculous. So um, I kind of thought, right, we're going to have to move on from this now and um, I decided to get into photography. Tell us about that. Well. It's always been in my life because my, both my grandmothers were photographers and my, my maternal grandmother used to retouch photographs, retouch negatives. Um, so it's always been there. Um, I kind of wanted to do art at school but was pushed in the languages and politics direction by my parents um, who now realise it was stupid because I'm now a freelance photographer with, with no formal training. Um, but. Um, so yeah, I, I basically just started to advertise as a photographer. Um, at this stage I hadn't thought about fetish photography, um, but I just used to kind of... I, there were web, websites like uh, Model Mayhem where you can find models. I just used to contact them and just start photographing people. Created a website. Uh, then my mum paid for me to go in the Yellow Pages, the local one for central London. Um, and I got real-time real calls. And I was running a photography studio out of a bedsit in Bethel Green. You know, a bedsit is like a really small room where you just have like the stove in the corner in your bed. It's just one tiny little cell block. Okay. And I turned it into a photo studio. And then people would come and, you know, they'd look around and go, what the hell is this? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I started to turn out good photos. and. The majority of people that came were people who, because things like LinkedIn were starting and, and mm. Facebook and the need for you to have a professional portrait of you were, was, was, was starting to become the thing. And um, a lot, most of, of the people who booked me as a photographer were business people needing a shot for a presentation, they were going to do a conference or something. Um, so I thought, well, okay, let's do corporate photography then. So I rebranded the website as a corporate photographer and then yeah, within about, after about a year of that, I was making a living as a freelance corporate photographer. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it was, it was kind of, it, I, it, was, it was amazing. Um, that then enabled me to get this place um, and uh, have a, because I've got, now I've got a proper, well, a good sized portrait studio and it's in Soho. So I have no problem getting photo jobs now. It's really easy. Um, in fact, um, I even rent the space for other photographers sometimes. Um, but the fetish thing came in. Um, I think an ex, an, ex, an ex of mine were having a drink in a bar and we're looking through, we're just bitching at the escorts in the back of the uh, gay newspapers. And um, 
he said, what you should do is you should actually contact these escorts and ask if they want photo shoots done. Um, because, you know, then you could have another string to your bow. You could do kind of like gay male erotica. And it still hadn't occurred to me that there was, I could be a fetish photographer. But I did. I called some escorts. Um, and then um, it was when Recon started, which it wasn't called Recon then, it was called World Leathermen. Mm -hmm. And um, Phil Hamill was going around Gaydar and sort of poaching leather guys to come to his new site, worldleathermen.com. Um, and then I looked at worldleathermen.com and I thought that, that there are a lot of pictures. Well, I was doing hookups with people and I was meeting a lot of people that didn't look like what they looked like in their pictures. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting niche because um, there might be a need for people to have decent fetish pictures, you know, in the same way that people in business need a profile pic. Right. Maybe people in the fetish world should have more realistic pictures. So I put some text on my worldleathermen.com profile saying that I am, I'm a photographer, um, I've got a studio space, um, I can take your photograph and you can use it on worldleathermen.com. And then that just kind of... <laughs> um, immediately after that, uh, I stopped being known as the escort because um, I'd become a little bit infamous a bit with the escorting name. Um, and uh, people started refer referring to me as the fetish photographer. And I was like, fucking hell, this is weird. Um, and then I got a call from uh, the guy who now does the PR for the Backstreet. Um, there was a porn film being made in there and they needed someone to do the stills for it. So that was my first ever fetish shoot, was at the Backstreet during a porn film. Um, and then Antoine from Recon contacted me possibly a couple of months or a couple of years later and said, um, we're doing a shoot for the second ever Fetish Week in London. Um, our photographer dropped out. We need someone straight away. Can you do it? And I was like, <coughs> yes. <laughs> and immediately I was dropped into a daylight, a gigantic daylight studio near Liverpool Street in London um, uh, with about eight models to direct. And I was just left to it. And I'm not particularly proud of it. Looking back, it looks, you know, compared to what I can do these days, it mm. looks really amateurish. But um, uh, that got me started, that got me commercial work, and then it all just kind of carried on from there, really. How long have you been doing this? Nearly 10 years. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you feel is your greatest personal achievement? Personal achievement? Uh, I think, does, it, does that question have to be fetish related, or can it just be anything? That's up to you. Okay. Well, my, I think my personal, I'll start again. <clears throat> I think my greatest personal achievement is overcoming that kid that was held down in school by their throat and kind of cut open by a okay. craft knife. I could easily have just basically decided to become a recluse or a quiet person. In fact, I am naturally quite shy and quite quiet. Um, my, my whole life has been about overcoming that. Oh, okay. Um, it really has. Um, and I don't, I don't, I, I hide it from people. I even hide it from my family. Um, but so my, so my, birth, you know, to be able to stand here and be interviewed by an American journalist, I guess, and you know, and to do big shoots for, you know, fetish entities all around London, to be personally commissioned by people to do their photos, to have ex, to have had exhibitions. Um, all that took a lot of inner strength from me. You know, I could easily have said no. I, a lot of times, wanted to say no. I was very frightened. There is such a thing as well as um, photographer's stage fright. A lot, of, a lot of people think the person getting photographed is um, the person that gets scared. But, uh, yeah, we're kind of fucked on the floor or something. He's heading away. Yeah. Do you want Doug to come back in with the question again and start it from the beginning, or do you want to pick up? I am happy to pick up. Okay. So yeah. Just okay. The shot. Hang on. So back to Doug. Yeah. Okay. Because there is there is such a thing as photographers' stage fright. Uh, most photographers I know have it, and there's a oh, it's okay. a sort of a, a, a pang of anxiety before you do a, a major photo shoot, you know, because you have an, an idea in your head of what's going to happen, and usually the outcome is completely different. So how you get from your expectation to your outcome is um, sometimes quite frightening. Um, uh, I, I've lost my trace. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but you said you did things your way. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, it's like I said, um, that decision to leave that dreadful job in television um, was was really the kind of the um, the turning point for me. 
um, realizing that I could make my way in this world without having to rely on a, a corporate entity of any kind. Um, uh, just making my way through my world, just being myself. Um, surviving, just being myself. Um, not, re not relying on anybody, being entirely self-reliant and making my own decisions. I've never really had to kind of bend my will to anybody. Um, I haven't done it, I haven't achieved things by being nasty or vicious or mean. I've just literally just kind of positioned myself and arranged my life to, um, to suit myself. Um, which I think is a quite a good achievement. Um, Absolutely. Because a lot of people are obliged to do things they don't want to do in life. Um, I've never really had to, to deal with that. But it has, it has come at a huge price, and that is that I've, I've, I've had to really fight hard with myself to be strong to do that. Yeah. What differences do you see between the fetish community and the leather community into which you entered versus what we have today? Uh, well, this is a very contentious issue at the moment. <laughs> um, I think that, like, <coughs> one of the things I notice a lot of these days is um, this idea of people being concerned about how people are inducted into the fetish community, mm. whereas I didn't really experience that. Um, it was like either come or, or don't come. Um, so, you, and whereas these days I think there's a lot, a lot of people talking about newbies coming into the leather scene. Um, he might need to be looked after and sort of guided in. A natural fact, last night, as you know, I think I told you, I introduced you to him, didn't I? Um, my friend, who uh, was fascinated by the leather scene, I took him shopping last week for a full outfit. And last night at the back street, I took him to for his first gay bar ex experience. Yes, OK. I, yeah. I recall now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, I think these days what's changed is, is the way that you enter the leather scene. Because it's, because it's so saturated with apps and magazines and advice yeah. and, you know, um, uh, Twitter and there's so many websites and personal blogs and you can, you can learn so much um, just going through the internet. Um, I think that it, that's what's changed mostly for me, is that um, in my day, <laughs> you just had to basically go out, find a thrift store, yeah. dress yourself up and just go and do it, you know. Um, um, the other big change is that, um, and it's interesting because you're going to be speaking to Susie tomorrow, but um, because she started the first club that basically took fetish into the dance floor, in London at least, um, is that uh, these days um, things are not so much bar-based anymore. So right. we lost the hoist, the hoist closed. Various other pubs, uh, gay leather-friendly leather pubs have closed over the years. Um, now we just have the back street as a bar. Um, and uh, everything, all fetish events are now based in clubs. Yeah. So it's all about dancing in your fetish gear. Um, that's a huge change that's happened as well. That format is now, I think, really, really quite... It's, it's the go-to format. It's even getting a little tired, actually. Because I think no, most I people end up sat, stood in the smoking area, yeah. chatting rather than dancing and stuff. Um, yeah. I think people are looking for connection. Um, and somewhere along the way, it's all got lost in this kind of uh, sort of dance fetish culture that's going on, which I don't disapprove of. It's, it's a hell of a good fun to, you know, dance on the dance floor in a pair of chaps. It's great, you know. But um, uh, we're just talking about differences, so that's that's definitely one of the big differences that's happened. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What's the significance of your ink? Oh, my ink. <laughs> There's no significance. There's none. <laughs> oh, seriously? No. Um, okay. Uh, it's just a collection of um, places I was at in my head over the last year. And all, these are all done at different times. Um, some of them are cover-ups. Oh. There's the name of, of an ex-partner on there, um, which I'm going to change at some point. Um, but I just liked ink, really. Um, people have often asked me that question over the years. You know, what does all this mean? And I'm like, it doesn't mean anything. It's like I literally just basically just took my neck and just doodled on it, except with, well, got, got a tattooist to doodle on it with a tattoo needle. Um, yeah, they're just their decoration. Oh, <laughs> all right. Yeah. What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh, well, um, probably that I'm really strong. Um, probably that I'm really kind of uh, a bit tough and a bit hard, maybe. Um, that's, that, that's a real misconception, because I'm actually not. 
I'm quite shy and introverted. And I, like I said before, I have to force my way out of that um, to uh, just sometimes even go and get milk some days. Um, but yeah, I, w I would say from the image I've put out there of myself um, and the work I do, um, and the way, I make, the way I make myself so visible, people might assume that I'm quite, um, you know, tough or um, perhaps more arrogant or, than I am, um, whereas I'm not. I'm actually a pussycat. <laughs> Matt Spike, thank you very much for being part of Inside Leather History and Fireside Chat. Thanks, Doug. Again, I thank you for the use of your uh, studio here in Soho. You're most welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. All right. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay.